Hey everybody, God bless you. Welcome back to Love Has a Name. My name is Brother Brian. And in this video, we are going to be going into this short teaching series that the Lord placed on my heart. Actually, it was through a dream that the Lord confirmed he wanted me to teach on this. So we will be learning about Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8. In this video, we are only going through Romans chapter 6 though. Amen. Today is Sunday, March 13th, 2022, and it is also Daylight Savings uh, Day. So hopefully you did not forget, those of you who it affects, to set your clocks forward one hour. All right, so we are going to pray and get into this study. I will be reading from the New King James Version. Of course, you can have pretty much any version. And so before we pray, <clears throat> you know, this entire week, the enemy has continued and continued to try to convince me to agree with him to cause me to think that I am sick or getting sick, but I am not. And I refuse to bow and I refuse to accept, accept his lies. So um, I honestly feel fine. The uh, here and there, I have to clear my throat, a little bit, a little bit of coughing there, but I refuse to accept what he wants. So I know some of you have probably wondered and a few of you have asked, no, I do not have any allergies. I actually have a, an awesome testimony. That's one of the first supernatural healings out of three that I have received in my 21 year walk with the Lord. <clears throat> so obviously I will do my best to not, not have things interrupt. Got some hot tea here, but that is not going to stop me. And of course the enemy wants to hinder my voice because I have been diligent since January 1st this year. So we're looking at about two and a half months that I have been uploading and recording videos daily. I think I missed only one day. <coughs> Nonetheless, the enemy is not going to stop me because I am doing the will that the Lord has for me. And it has been very clear. He's been confirming things. There are things that he, I hear him speak in visions and dreams throughout the night, things that are personal that I may not always share, but I know that I am on the right path. It does not mean that I am doing everything perfect. Amen. Because none of us are perfect. We are all going through a process. The important thing is stay in your lane, stay with the Lord, and of course, have an open heart to ask questions when you're not sure of something. That is the best way. Have a posture of being humble, meek, willing to learn, inquisitive, even curious, right? In order to receive understanding by the grace of God, wisdom, his knowledge, and so forth, we have to be open and willing to learn. Okay, student mentality. So let us pray and then we're going to get into Romans chapter 6 and see what the Lord has for us today. Father, <coughs> thank you, Lord, that you are good. And beyond that, you are absolutely good. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the grace that you give us every day, Father. Thank you for blessing our spirits, our souls, our bodies. I do ask that you touch your people who are watching this and all those who will watch this teaching through out the years to come. We bless you and we ask for the Holy Spirit. Lead us into all truth, Holy Spirit. Open unto us the eyes of our understanding so that we may understand and perceive and receive revelation that only you can give, not by our own might or power or mental capacity or ability, but rather by the Spirit of the Lord, who is the author of the Word of God. In Jesus' name, we thank you for all that you will do in this video, through this teaching. And to you be all the glory, Father. Amen and amen. All right. <clears throat> so Romans 6, hopefully you have your Bible. This is a Bible study. Amen. 
And of course, there is a uh, Bible study playlist that I've set up for those of you who may be new. Maybe you've, you've haven't seen any of these teachings, but I have done them um, and I do them at the leading of the Lord. So you will find in the Bible study teachings playlist, I have one on Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians. I have one on the book of 1 John, all five chapters. I have the one uh, on John 14, 15, 16, and 17, which are uh, so rich, so rich in revelation. And you never know how the Holy Spirit is going to lead me in teaching and giving testimonies and experiential knowledge, sharing things that I myself have experienced that prove, or rather that are in line with the Word of God, that it's proved to me and where the scriptures have become life to me and therefore I can speak from a place of authority having experienced those things. So let us grow together. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> what shall we say then? Shall we continue? Oh, thank you, Lord. The anointing of the Lord is, is coming down. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Mm. All right, well, whew. I'm going to read all the way through it, and then we're going to come back, because obviously there's going to be such a richness in these three chapters. Amen? But I already know the first talking point of what I'm going to have. It's in that first verse. All right. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many Hallelujah. That as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead. Therefore. Sorry, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe also that we will live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been ra raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For death, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. <clears throat> Likewise, you also reckon yourselves that means consider yourselves to be dead indeed to sin but alive to god in christ jesus our lord verse 12 therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts and do not present your members that means your body, right? Parts of your body, your hands, your arms, your legs, your feet. Do, uh, where was I? Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. 
for sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. All right, verse 15. What then shall we sin because we are not under law, <clears throat> but under grace? Certainly not. Do you know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you then, did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit in holiness and the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Mm, amen. All right, so that is Romans 6, read all the way through. <clears throat> and now we're going to let the Holy Spirit... Um, highlight a couple of areas and so we'll see how he leads because honestly i have no idea i just know that he's going to teach because he has poured a lot into me throughout these years not only in my own time but much of that through others that i have listened to and learned from and because i'll give you the secret if you learn to remain open at all times then eventually all that you are listening to and learning because you kept that posture of an open heart, in humility, in meekness, in a spirit of, of a student, a student of the word, trusting that God will teach you the truth, not being afraid of being deceived, because you know God wouldn't do that. So you must trust in who God is. Because of this, eventually the time will come where the understanding that you're given will be, will be quicker, it will be easier and you'll assimilate and you will allow yourself to be saturated and permeated, thank you, with the word of God and with the truth to the point where you yourself can be reading with someone or talking to someone and that truth, that revelation, that understanding that you have absorbed and assimilated will be able to be used through you to teach someone else, amen? I bind you and cast you out in Jesus' name. <clears throat> so from time to time, as some of you, as many of you know, the Lord shows me spots. And whenever I see those spots, it's demonic spirits lurking. And they count on not being seen. And so when I see them, I must address them. So that is that. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> All right. So that very first verse, check this out. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How can we who died to sin live any longer in it? Now, I don't know any specific pastors or preachers who teach this, but I know that it's being done because I've heard a lot about, a lot about it. <coughs> and that is the false doctrine and false teaching of people who teach what is called hyper grace 
Maybe you haven't known it by that terminology, but there are those who believe, and this is just horrible to think that people believe this. <coughs> they believe that we are under grace to the point where, okay, we received Jesus as Lord and Savior, we repented once, now these people say, you can live however you want, because there's so much grace. If there wasn't, if, if, if uh, sin didn't exist, then grace wouldn't be there to, you know, to cover it. So you're covered. So just do whatever you want. That is absolutely wrong. That is false. That is just plain stupid, in my opinion. That is demonic teaching. Okay, even the word of God, which we just read, speaks against this. And this is the scripture here, very clearly. Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Paul himself said it, certainly not. Not only in verse 2, <clears throat> but I noticed he mentioned it also in verse 15, where he says, What then shall we sin because we are not under law, meaning the law of Moses, but under grace? And again, he answers, certainly not. Okay, so that should be our first clue. If we're going to believe the Bible, then we need to believe that the Holy Spirit is the one speaking through the apostles and the prophets, and of course, through our Lord Jesus Christ. And twice it has already been spoken, even once would have been enough. Anyone who believes in this hyper grace, it's, it's almost as if to say they want to purposely live in sin. And that is a terrible place to be. So let if you have ever felt or wondered about that, hopefully you have no more confusion anymore for the very truth that I'm speaking forth and explaining to you may it break and destroy that yoke of deception upon anyone out there who believes that it is okay to sin because the grace is going to cover it. No, that is not true. And that is just like the devil. So we don't want to do that. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So look at verse three. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, Jesus, into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism. Now, the Lord, the, the Lord here, the Holy Spirit through Paul, is speaking about water baptism. Okay? Water baptism is important. It is very important. But I, we need to make one thing clear. Because there are believers who say, if you don't get water baptized, then you're not saved. Well, then what about the thief on the cross? who basically said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus himself said, today you will be with me in paradise. He got saved. And the Lord literally told him, you're going to come with me to paradise, which at that time, at that time was in the center of the earth and then transitioned to heaven in the heavens. All right, into the third heaven. <clears throat> but... If a person is able to get baptized, absolutely they should. Where should you do it? You can do it anywhere. Do it at church, do it at the beach, do it in a pool, do it in your bathtub if you want to, if you have to. There will be people who say, no, you, you can't sprinkle it because it has to be full immersion. All these, this, this religious thinking doesn't help anybody. Now, obviously, it's a good idea to have the full immersive immersion experience where you go into, okay, pretend this is water, where you go literally into the water, right? Because that symbolizes you dying with Christ, right? Just as Christ died, you're dying with him. And what is the purpose of that? It's what we're talking about right here. As many as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. <clears throat> now, 
why is that important? Why is that symbolism important? Why is this, why is this act of obedience important? Because it's not only for us, but it's for those who we're doing it in front of to be witnesses. Now, Jesus died publicly. He died a, a brutal death publicly. He, he took it, all our sins and became sin. So we, without shame, should be able to confess the Lord Jesus Christ and our faith in him. And when you get water baptized, it's an outward expression of your inward faith that you want to live the way Jesus wants you to live, that you no longer want the, your old ways of rebellion, disobedience. Okay, so in front of the world, you say, I want Jesus, I want to be baptized, I want to do this to commit to God and to living like a Christian like a real Christian, not like most people who say they're Christian, but live like the devil. And that's just being direct because we know it's sadly true. All right. Now we talked about going into the water as, as uh, symbolic of dying with Jesus. Okay. But the best part is this next part here. <clears throat> Verse four, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Meaning the old, when you go down into the water, some symbolic of the old is passed away. And when you come up, it's like being resurrected as Christ was res resurrected. Now your old life has been buried with Christ just like when he died. And when he came back to life, now you are coming out of the water and it's symbolic of you coming up into newness of life. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new, right? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Verse five. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. And we were talking about that just now, right? <clears throat> okay, so now Paul, by the Holy Spirit, is not only going deeper, but he's almost speaking the same thing in different illustrative ways ways which is awesome because some of you may some of us may understand this in this whole illustration of um the water baptism you know death unto life and then some may understand it a little better here in this next part which says in verse six <clears throat> knowing this that our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with. So now it's been a little more specific. This body that used to carry out acts of sin, he's saying that the body of sin might be done away with, meaning that body cast it out as if it's old garments, old clothes, cast it off. And then the other second, uh, second part of verse six, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. All right. Verse seven, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Okay. So you got a person. Okay. It's a little remote here. This is you because you're alive and because you are in an earth suit right? A body that unfortunately has inherited a sinful nature, right? Because Adam and Eve were created perfectly. <coughs> and it was not until they sinned that their body lost the, the glory shining off of them, emanating off of them, shrunk back into their spirit man, 
which is why all of a sudden when they sinned, Adam and Eve, they looked down and they, they were ashamed because they were naked. Well, what did the Lord tell them? Who told you you were naked? So they didn't realize that. Why? Because they were, they were, they were like God. For the Lord said, let us create man in our likeness and in our image. They had glory shining off of them. They were beings of light. But when they sin, that light, it's as if it sunk deep into them, into their spirit. For their spirit died. And now, eventually, they saw at that moment that they had bodies and that they were naked. They were no longer clothed with light, with the glory. And they saw themselves and they were ashamed. Okay? <clears throat> so, that body of sin, sin ha has power over the body and had power over the body throughout all these generations. But when Jesus came, okay, so I don't have another prop here, but when Jesus came, okay, let's be my hand. My hand is Jesus at the moment. <clears throat> when Jesus came in a body, According to Isaiah 9, 6, he was born of a virgin. And we know the story from the book of Luke in great detail that he did not sin. And he lived for 30 years. He began his ministry at age 30, which is symbolic of the number of maturity. Uh, David also began reigning when he was 30. Joseph was exalted um, just under Pharaoh at the age of 30. Okay, so the number 30 is symbolic of uh, a mature son of God. Okay, so Jesus did ministry for three and a half years and he never sinned in this body. So when he died, because he was perfected and the enemy had nothing in him, nothing to hook into his skin in a sense. Okay, and this we read about in, in John 17. Uh, which we talked about the other day, a couple weeks back. Mm, sorry, not John 17, but John 14. All right, so John 14, <coughs> verse 30. Jesus said, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. In other words... The devil had nothing to hook into Jesus. This is figurative, figuratively speaking. There was no sin. There was no portal. There was no opening that the devil could, could latch on to Jesus because he was sinless. He never sinned. Now, if someone, for example, you're a Christian, but you, you start to watch like a horror movie or you start doing something you shouldn't be doing that's sinful, you open a spiritual portal in your life and demonic spirits now have access. The enemy can hook onto you somehow. And if that issue is not repented of and dealt with and renounced, eventually it will become a stronghold. Okay? And so you go from... Um, some people have a lot of attacks in their minds, so it's like an obsession. It's like a demonic obsession. And then they start to get oppressed, right? So then you got oppression. And eventually, if not dealt with, it becomes possession. Possession. All right? Now, um, obviously that doesn't happen to a Christian, like a true Christian who's actually saved, but those who are not, they don't have Christ within them to defend. Demonic spirits can inhabit them. So, <clears throat> uh, reining it all back, because Jesus, in his body, like us, never sinned, he was the perfect sacrifice. Okay, So, mankind, in this body susceptible to sin sin has power because of that sinful nature but what is jesus saying now i'm sorry i know i took a long time explaining that but if you hung here hung here with me then you realize it's all worth it because i'm about to explain why okay and the lord kind of took me this way and i didn't expect it here what we just read verse six knowing this that our old man was crucified with him, okay? So this is our old man, crucified with him, 
that the body of sin, the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So he's going to explain it a little clearer, but basically if you are, if you have symbolically died to yourself, which Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, I believe that's verse 31. Let's hop over there. I'll confirm that for you. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31. I affirm by the boasting in which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. Now, obviously, he's not talking about that he, he gets killed every day in the natural. He's talking about he puts his flesh to death. The human desires, the carnal desires, he puts it to death every day. That's what he's talking about. Okay, so now we're back at Romans 6, and I'm just going to read a little bit through, and you will grasp the spiritual illustration here. Verse 7, For he who has died has been freed from sin. So technically, if I say, I'm not going to live a life of sin anymore, I want Jesus, I want to be baptized by water, and then I do it, and I mean it with all my heart, well, spiritually speaking, the Lord has set me free. Now, yes, I was already saved, but baptism is an important part of that process. And then, of course, you got to be filled with the power to, to remain um, overcoming in, over sin and so forth. And that power comes through the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, which is why those people who are filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues and they practice it regularly, they regularly succeed in walking out this Christian life. As, uh, whereas those who reject the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, they are the ones who struggle the most because they don't have the power that has been, av been made available to them because they choose to reject it because they depend on their own mind, their finite mind, to try to explain something spiritual by their natural mind, which will never work. First Corinthians chapter 1 and 2 explain this extremely clearly for those willing to receive the truth of God. So, as we are reading here, verse 8, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon or you also consider yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if this is you and you're like, okay, I'm going to get baptized. I'm serious about God. I baptize, get myself baptized in water. I come up. I believe it. I have faith. I'm going forth with the Lord. You basically have, by the power of God, broken the power of sin over you. Now, every single day, you need to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow after him. That's what Jesus said. And that goes in line with what Paul just said in 1 Corinthians 15, 31. I myself die daily. And then, thank you, Lord, he also says it here. Let me find you the exact scripture. Chapter 2. <clears throat> ah, yes. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. What does that mean? I'm putting my desires, my flesh to death. And now it is no longer I, Paul, who's speaking, or, or me, myself, or yourself. No longer you who live, but Christ in you that is living through you. And how do you accomplish that? Well, you learn to yield to the Holy Spirit. You learn to discern good versus evil, and then you have to choose the good. Now, that brings us to what we read in the second half of Romans 6, which is, do not let Verse 12, do not let sin reign, that means rule, in your mortal body. So yes, you died to sin, but you need to remain living in the spirit 
And at the same time, you have to remain dead to sin, meaning you choose right over wrong consistently. And every time you choose right over wrong, it becomes a little bit easier to obey God. And it becomes easier to not sin and not do those things that are sinful. And because of that, you now give your body over to doing acts of righteousness. And the members of your body, your hands, right? You're not stealing. That's just an example. Your feet, you're not running to do evil, right? Which is, it speaks of in Proverbs that the Lord, there's eight, uh, six things that he hates, seven that he abhors. And one of them is feet that are quick to run to do evil. And so this is what he, what he means when he says your members. Verse 12, finishing up. Uh, Therefore, do not let sin rule in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not not under the law, you are under grace. Interesting here. If a person says we need to, you know, they're very, very religious, religious minded. God's in a little box for them. Everything is so rigid. Well, that person is a slave unto sin. These people say, you must obey the Ten Commandments, but they stress it in a negative way. They stress it in a way as if, as if they completely forget about the Holy Spirit. For without the Holy Spirit, you cannot obey God. You can't do it on your own. That's the point. Jesus said in John 15, without me, you can do nothing. Sounds pretty clear to me, right? So why do we why, why are we trying to do it ourselves? Why make things harder than they have to be? So a person who is such a stickler for the law completely ignores what God said through Paul, love fulfills the law. Love. Well, how how can you love the way God loves? Well, first you need to learn to obey God out of love, not out of fear of condemnation or fear of going to hell, which is greater, fear or love. Obviously love. We read in 1 John, perfect love, okay? And the Bible says God is love, so perfect love, so God casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Love is greater than fear. Therefore, those who have not been perfected in love, they live in fear of torment, in fear of being punished. Man, I I personally lived there for over 10 years. I didn't even realize it. But I've been free for about, uh, if I'm counting correctly, for about four years give or take, I have been like living in freedom with that religious mindset just broken off of me, set free from all that. So now I live in freedom and it bothers religious people. Sometimes I'll read comments and I can, I can tell the religious people because of what they say. And it's really sad, but, um, it's like people are offended because I have so much joy. People are offended because I speak with authority. People are offended because I speak the truth boldly, but yet I'm not putting anyone down. I speak with love. Some people are offended, jealous, envious. There's no need. It's available for everyone. But God's not going to bend to our way of thinking. For his, even his word says in Isaiah that his thoughts and his ways are higher than ours. So we need to die to self, meaning die to your way of thinking that God is a certain way and wake up and live and just accept what God says. 
and accept that you won't understand everything, but that if you seek God, he's a merciful God and a gracious God, and he will give you understanding. It may also not be in your timing, but that's a part of growing with God, learning to wait and be patient. That is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5.22. So you see, even as I'm explaining, <coughs> excuse me, even as I'm explaining and elaborating, other scriptures and other things Jesus has spoken are just surfacing and they're coming up and I'm speaking them and they all connect. And some of these scriptures are Old Testament. Some of them are New Testament. The point is the Holy Spirit is teaching for those available and willing to receive it. We want to make it. I want to make it practical. That's one of the things I, I love is being practical, being efficient, doing things the smart way and not the hard way, the easier way if possible. <clears throat> and having sharing my experiences so others don't have to go the hard route, but rather they can accomplish and come into their destiny that much quicker. Amen. So, man, that I know that was a lot, but um, I, I hope you're getting something out of this. Let me know in the comments if you are. Ah, praise the Lord. Okay, so we are at the very least have gone through verse 14. So I'm going to just skim right here, see if anything else pops up. But pretty much Paul is explaining what it means to be dead to sin and why we have to resemble in our life what Christ did. Because in truth, if we've received Christ, then when Christ himself died, he took us with him. We just have to receive that, believe it's true, and prove that we believe it's true, right? But tr prove our faith by our works. What works? Not works to get saved. No, we're already saved. Our works need to prove that we believe and we've received that it's already been done for us. How do I prove that every day? How do you prove it every day? When you wake up and you decide, I'm going to do what pleases God in your thoughts, in your words, in your actions. And every day, <clears throat> if you have to say something like this out loud, go ahead and say it. Lord, I choose to die to myself and I choose to be alive in Christ. I will not yield my body to sin. I will yield my body to the Holy Spirit. I will not yield my thoughts to the carnal mind. I will yield my thoughts to the mind of Christ. I'm literally just making this up as I'm speaking, but what I'm speaking is in line with the word of God, right? So these are things you can say, maybe that'll help you. Maybe you want to write it on a post-it and put it on your bathroom mirror or in your bedroom or by your nightstand or by the door before you go out the door in your car. Why not? These are things you can do to help remind you. I'll write on your fridge, write on your closet, etc. And you begin to speak these things because we have power in our words. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat of its fruit. And Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What are your, what are your words saying every day? Your words reflect what's in your heart. So if you're being, if you're complaining and being negative every day, well, that's not of God. And that means you're full of something that is not of God. So you've got to loose those things from your soul. You've got to forgive. You've got to let things go. You have to choose to fill yourself with the word of God. Put on worship, put on praise music, listen to anointed leaders. Don't spend your time criticizing. God's never called anyone with an anointing to criticize other people or to judge others, or to tell people what they're doing wrong, or to say false prophet this, false prophet that. That's a really low level of a basic Christian, if that's all you're doing all the time. Don't take offense. If you feel offended, well, Jesus offended people all the time by speaking the truth. Why else do you think the Pharisees were always enraged? Because he spoke the truth and because they were the hypocrites. Who are always being convicted but rather than repenting 
they chose to get angry. And so hopefully there's none of you out there who are getting angry. But if you are, take it to God. He's ready, willing to forgive you. And maybe one day you'll be thankful that someone, such as myself and some others, spoke the truth in love, boldly. God's not messing around with everything going on in the world. You want to be right with God. Don't wait until He shows up. And I'm not talking rapture. I'm not talking second coming. I'm talking don't wait until you see what's about to happen in this world. And then you realize, oh my gosh, I was wrong. I spoke bad about this leader and that leader and about those prophets and those people who were prophesying. I spoke bad. Yeah, there are many out there who will be repenting. But um, anyway. Hmm. All right, so now, I've always thought of Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8. I mean, crucial. I feel like they go together. So Romans 6 explains being dead to sin, alive to God. It kind of breaks down the ins and outs of how that works with different parallels and illustrations. And then verse uh, chapter 7 of Romans really speaks of like the... Oh, it's like Paul relating to everybody. You know, when he said, oh, when I want to do right, I do wrong. And when I don't want to do wrong, I... Uh, when I don't want to do... Um, how do he say it? <laughs> if I do what I don't want to do, then it's no longer me, but it's sin dwelling in me. And it's this whole like thing that everyone can relate to. I remember so many years, I was like, wow, Romans 7, like that's me. Why, why, why? I was so frustrated. But <coughs> the good news comes in Romans chapter 8. And I heard Kevin Zeta say this one time. The problem is, most of us are living in Romans 7 when we, should, when we ought to be living in Romans 8. So, when we get to chapter 7, it's going to be heavy. Obviously, you all are going to know that we're all going through this. We've all gone through this at some point. Some of us are out of it. Don't really go through it that much. But, uh, Romans 8, so powerful. And I can't wait to speak on that one. That's where we need to get the body of Christ in. This is where the remnant abides in. This is where those who are victorious and overcomers, conquerors. This is where we live, in Romans 8. Alright, so Romans 6 is kind of like an introduction to the issue. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. I suppose we'll just close for this, um, this session. I pretty much already explained about the members of sin, righteousness, you choose, that's your body, whether you do right or wrong. And let me just finish up here with the very last part here. Verse 22, Romans 6, verse 22. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God. Now that's God's... He's not saying that in a negative way. Oh my gosh, God is my slave master and I'm the slave. No, that's not what he means. Okay. Having become slaves of God, you have your fruit, meaning you allow God to be Lord. So many Christians want Jesus as Savior. But only a few allow him to actually be Lord. Now, I heard someone say this one time and it, it hit me and it really stuck with me. If you have received Jesus as Savior, you're saved and that's great. Congratulations. But those who live the victorious life, who live the, that abundant life, spirit, soul and body, those are the ones who allow Jesus to be Lord over their life. What is a Lord? A Lord is somebody who is over you. They're your manager. They tell you what to do and you do it. Someone you obey. Obedience is the fruit of true faith. Obedience out of love. Man, it's like the windows of heaven open upon your life and they stay open. So, 
Verse 23, the last thing. For the wages, the payment, the penalty, the consequences of sin is death. So if a person continues to practice sin all the time, all the time. Now, I'm not talking about people who are trying to overcome it and they're doing well and they slip, they do, they're doing well and then they fall. I'm not talking about those who are actually trying, practicing a righteous lifestyle and they make mistakes. No. Here we're talking about those who practice sin, meaning they enjoy it. They don't really have any intentions of quitting or stopping. They just do it all the time. But they say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm going to heaven. Mm, very questionable. Um, the wages of sin is death. Spiritual death. But the gift of God. Gift. He's given it to you. You don't have to earn it. He's given it to you. You just take it and you appreciate it and you show you've appreciated it by obeying the Master, the Lord, and growing in love with Him. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, that is that. So um, I know it didn't start out too well and it seemed to kind of be all over the place, but I think at the very end, the Holy Spirit did a good job of bringing things together. And as you can see, I try not to pay attention to any of the coughing and whatever, because I do not need to allow the enemy to overtake me. So it is what it is. We're in a broken world and a fallen world. I'm not pleased about it but that's what it is and so hopefully that served as an example to you as well sometimes you just have to learn the art of ignoring ignore the devil he hates it and eventually he stops messing with you for a good long season when he realizes he doesn't get you to react i haven't spoken one negative word i haven't accepted being sick or having allergies or anything and i'm not going to period and this is an example of why by the grace of god i live victorious amen so that is that i hope you enjoyed it um definitely check out the videos here at the very end that will show up here and here and if you have not subscribed please hit subscribe right up top here and i would greatly appreciate it so leave your comments let me know your thoughts hopefully you'll check out the other teachings and stay tuned uh coming up will be romans 7 and roman 8 romans 8 amen god bless you and i will see you very soon